I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to The Bigfoot Project. The following stories have been narrated from the book Bigfoot Casebook Updated, Sightings and Encounters from 1818 to 2004, written by Janet and Colin Board. During the 1970s, there was an increased interest in Bigfoot reports and an increased number of reported sightings. As public awareness of the phenomenon grew, so did the possibility that hoaxes were perpetrated or that people unknowingly misinterpreted normal events and in good faith reported them as Bigfoot sightings. However, the cases we report have usually been carefully investigated and often involve more than one witness. Also, as we have increasingly seen during the process of this book, another equally inexplicable phenomenon, the UFO, has sometimes been reported in conjunction with a Bigfoot sighting. Our first report for 1976 is of this dual phenomenon type. On the 22nd of February, a man driving near the Great Falls Airport in Montana saw a seven-foot Bigfoot in a field near the road. One version of the report mentions three creatures. He grabbed his gun and went after it on foot, but when it turned towards him, he retreated to his car. He also reported seeing a gray oval UFO hovering 10 to 15 feet above the ground about half a mile away from the road. We shall return to Montana shortly. On the 29th of February, only a week after the UFO Bigfoot sighting just described, two people walking near the Settlers Park area of Oakdale, Pennsylvania, in the mid-afternoon, saw a 7 to 8 foot tall, dark, hair-covered biped. It had long arms, claws, wrinkled skin on its face, and skin hanging over the eyes. Even stranger, the witnesses reported that it had bumps in place of ears and a dent near the middle of its forehead. Is it only coincidence that the previous night a UFO was seen over the area and there was a brief power failure in town? Back in Montana, the early morning of the 4th of April, 1976, proved a frightening time for 16-year-old Robert Lee of Helena. At 4.30 a.m. he awoke and was looking out of his bedroom window, which faced fields. About 5 a.m. he noticed an 8-foot tall, dark, hair-covered Bigfoot walking smoothly across the pasture, turning its head around as it did so. It appeared to have no neck. It was joined by another, slightly shorter but otherwise of similar appearance. Then the larger Bigfoot reached down and picked up a dark object, about the size of a bale of hay with something flapping from its ends. He handed it to the other, who carried it. The larger creature walked towards the house and looked at the window where Robert was. At this, Robert ran downstairs to wake his father, but although they were back at the window within two minutes, there was no trace of the big feet. Later, a 17 and a half inch three-toed footprint was found. Robert was interviewed by two experienced deputy sheriffs who believed he had seen what he reported. During that same month of April, the residents of Flintville, Tennessee, were experiencing inexplicable events. Among the people who reported seeing a Bigfoot was a woman whose car aerial had been grabbed by one that jumped on the roof of her car. Perhaps the most frightening incident at Flintville took place on the 26th of April, when Mrs. Jenny Robertson nearly lost her four-year-old son Gary to a Bigfoot. Gary was playing outside in the evening when his mother heard him cry out. She rushed out and saw this huge figure coming around the corner of the house. It was seven or eight feet tall and seemed to be all covered with hair. It reached out its long hairy arm toward Gary and came within a few inches of him before I could grab him and pull him back inside. Mr. Robertson ran to the door when he realized something was amiss and was just in time to see a black shape disappearing into the woods. Six men tracked the Bigfoot and got near enough to fire at it repeatedly, but although it screamed, it gave no sign of succumbing to the onslaught of bullets. Instead, it threw rocks at its attackers for a while before running away into the brush. Next day, 16-inch footprints were found, as well as hair, blood, and mucus. The hair was scientifically analyzed, but could not be identified. In late August 1976, Bigfoot sightings were being reported from the Whitehall area of New York State. Marty Paddock and Paul Goslin saw the creature two or three times in the same area on the 24th of August, and police who were called also saw it, 
although only from a distance. The usual description was of a seven to eight foot creature, very hairy and with pink or red eyes. On one occasion, the Bigfoot was seen at close range by a police patrolman, actually Paul Goslin's older brother and a state trooper. This was on the 25th of August, when the Bigfoot came to within 25 feet of Patrolman Goslin's squad car. When the state trooper flashed the light in its eyes, it covered them and ran off screaming. In September 1976, a Bigfoot hoax emerged from Cashton, Wisconsin, where four youths admitted dressing up one of their number to resemble Bigfoot and making Bigfoot tracks by means of large pieces of wood fixed to his shoes. However, a real Bigfoot sighting may have been hidden behind all the ballyhoo about the hoaxing. Around the 1st of September, a farmer saw a seven-foot-tall, dark, hairy creature which smelt very strong and made a beller which sounded something like a young bull would make. The farmer's dog rushed out and bit the Bigfoot on the leg, whereupon the creature brushed the dog aside. Some saliva fell on the dog, and the farmer and his wife noticed later that the saliva smelled the same as an odor they had noticed before on the cows that had been in the same part of the woods. The farmer had heard the creature bellowing often. Early in February 1977, a golf course superintendent just west of Delray Beach, Florida, chanced upon another bad-smelling Bigfoot. He saw the creature, which was at at least seven feet tall, about 1 a.m. It was drinking water from a lake near the second tee. The witness added that the Bigfoot was covered with long, black, shaggy hair and was very wide at the shoulders. When the pickup lights were shone on the Bigfoot, it looked around and then lumbered slowly away into the dense woods. The superintendent left a bunch of bananas at the edge of the woods and found them gone on his return at 5.30 a.m. The city police laughed at the witness's story, and the director of county animal regulation believed that he had seen a wild chimpanzee or orangutan, or just some damn fool in a gorilla suit trying to freak out lovers on the golf course at night. Big Feet may themselves try to freak out unsuspecting citizens on occasions. Did the Bigfoot that rocked Gerald St. Louis's camper truck on the night of the 7th of May 1977 have a sense of humor, or was it simply angry at the truck's presence in its territory? St. Louis and his two sons were sleeping inside the camper when the rocking woke them up. St. Louis opened the door and turned on the lights. He then saw, face to face, a hairy, brown-colored, and eight or nine tall creature with long arms. The light startled it, and it ran toward a fence about four and a half feet high and jumped over it with ease. I could see it standing there in the distance, just looking at us. The family had been camping by a market at Hollis, New Hampshire, but they were so scared they left immediately without the goods they had planned to sell the next day. They returned later with police, but no Bigfoot was to be seen. Interestingly, the same night, Stanley Evans and Jeff Warren, both aged 15, were also camping at Hollis and had a similar experience. Said Evans, The camper shook so bad I fell out of the bunk and a lamp fell and hit Jeff in the eye. As soon as we turned on a light, whatever it was ran away. Less than a week after this New Hampshire Bigfoot's camper rocking activities, about 300 miles south in the state of New Jersey, a strange, well-documented and promptly investigated series of Bigfoot sightings began. At Wantage, in the north of the state, something visited a remote farm on the 11th of May, 1977, and killed seven pet rabbits that were kept in a barn. The next evening, Mrs. Seitz felt somebody was around, so she and her husband and family watched the barn from a window in the house. They soon spotted a creature at least seven feet tall, standing on two legs below a farmyard lamp. Mrs. Seitz's description of the creature was, It was big and hairy. It was brown. It looked like a human with a beard and mustache. It had no neck. It looked like its head was just sitting on its shoulders. It had big, red, glowing eyes. The family dog bravely attacked it, but was casually swept aside. The dog ran away and was not seen again until the next day. The Bigfoot ran into the woods. The following evening, Friday the 13th, the children having been taken to stay with relatives, Mr. and Mrs. Seitz and two other people waited for the Bigfoot to put in another appearance. As before, and around the same time, it showed itself under the farmyard lamp. The watchers opened fire on it, using a two twenty two Magnum rifle and a four ten shotgun, 
so it ran into a shed and out again through a window. It then stood under a tree with arms outstretched and sights shot at it three or four times with deer slugs in my 410 gauge shotgun, and I know I hit it. The only reaction was a growl from the Bigfoot, so sights made for the safety of the house where the others had already retreated, out of ammunition. The Bigfoot ran away, followed by sights in his pickup truck, but it escaped into the fields. Two investigators from the Society for the Investigation of the Unexplained, R. Martin Wolfe and Stephen Maine, interviewed the Sites family on the 17th of May and were impressed by their sincerity. They also saw the dead rabbits and claw marks on the barn where the Bigfoot had first tried to break in. On returning to the farm on the 18th of May, the investigators learned that not long after they had left the night before, the creature had reappeared under the farmyard lamp. Although chased by sights in his truck, it had again escaped into the woods. That same evening, the investigators sat and watched the farmyard, armed with movie cameras, but naturally Bigfoot stayed away. In the following weeks, strange cries from a swamp and occasional sightings by members of the family indicated that the Bigfoot was still around, although it did not again openly visit the house. While a red-eyed Bigfoot was prowling around the Wantage, New Jersey farm, a white-eyed Bigfoot was frightening two 13-year-old boys near Eaton in Ohio, about 400 miles to the west. One of the boys described what happened. We were walking our dog, and she got excited about something. The dog tried to run away from us. I ran after her and picked her up. Suddenly, I smelled this awful stink, like rotten eggs. When my friend and I turned around, we saw a creature that was about nine foot tall, weighed about 500 pounds, and had dirty brown fur and white eyes. Its arms were real long and hung almost to the ground. The creature resembled the Bigfoot on the TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man. It chased us down near Old Camden Pike and through a field. It seemed like it was right behind us as it took large steps. When we almost reached my house, the thing vanished. Again, we have a clear indication that the Bigfoot had no intention of catching up with the witnesses. A nine-foot creature could have easily caught two frightened boys had it wanted to. The puzzle is, why did it chase them? Simply to scare them from its territory? Or does such behavior have some other significance? One suggested explanation is that perhaps some of these creatures are non-physical, being formed from whatever energy source is available, and need a continued supply of energy in order to remain visible. Energy given off by humans can be utilized as one source. A frightened human would undoubtedly yield more emotional energy than one who was not afraid. What better way to obtain life-giving energy, therefore, than to frighten and chase two boys? If this theory has any validity, it could also help to explain why Big Feet are so attracted to houses and people. It is not surprising that some Bigfoot witnesses refuse to talk about their experiences. A frightening encounter is best forgotten, they think, and talking about it is not the way to consign it to oblivion. If his wife had the details correct in the story she told, it is understandable that Ronald Jones did not want to relive his adventures of the night of the 30th of August, 1977. He was driving a truck on Route 258 in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, and saw what he thought was a human body lying near the road, so he stopped. He discovered that the body was in fact an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot weighing about 500 pounds and exuding a pungent smell. Jones threw a tire iron at the Bigfoot, which was now on its feet. He ran back to his truck, but the Bigfoot chased him and hit him on the back of his head. It held on to his truck when he tried to drive away, so he had to back into it before he could escape. It screamed like a woman and left claw marks on the door of the new Chevrolet. The Bigfoot sightings we have recorded in this book show clearly that the witnesses come from all age groups and all walks of life. Police patrolmen and deputy sheriffs are often witnesses since they are regularly called out to investigate sightings. In the next case, the witness was a 67-year-old Baptist minister, the Reverend S. L. Watley of Fort McCoy, Florida. He was cutting wood in the Ocala National Forest on the 11th of October, 1977, about 2 p.m., and having trouble with his chainsaw. He finally decided to return home, and it was at that point that he became aware that something was watching him from about three to 400 yards away. It was this hairy-like ape animal standing there in the palmetto bushes. 
It looked to me to be seven or maybe eight feet tall. It had a dark, chocolate-colored face, a face that was clear of hair and a flat nose. The arms, I couldn't tell what kind of hands it had, the arms went down into the palmetto bushes. Breasts were visible too. Thinking to tackle the unknown creature, Watley took an axe from his truck, but when he looked up again, the Bigfoot had gone. The fall of 1977 was a season that the people of Little Eagle, South Dakota, are unlikely to ever forget. From September to December, 28 Bigfoot sightings were reported there. Although many of the sightings were made in the brush around Little Eagle, occasionally a Bigfoot came closer to houses. A witness to one of these visits was a 70-year-old Indian woman, Hannah Shooting Bear, who, one night about 10 p.m., looked out of her kitchen window and saw a large, hairy-shaped silhouette against the lighted windows of a nearby mobile home. She could see enough to describe the creature as having a funny big head, almost as though it had horns and wide shoulders. Its arms were up and the hands curled down, and it swayed back and forth. She got her dogs outside, but they were scared and crawled under a car. Hannah Shooting Bear ran to the mobile home and alerted the occupants, who searched outside, but the animal had gone, leaving a smell like a dead person. Lieutenant Verdell Villa, a police officer for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, was much involved in the events around Little Eagle and had some sightings himself. On the 29th of October, together with his sons and two other officers, Villa was out on Elkhorn Buttes near Little Eagle. They spotted a Bigfoot in the moonlight and two of the men began to walk towards it. Villa had a strange feeling that no weapon would have been of any use. Something told me, I could sense it if you can understand, that I better just get out of there and leave the thing alone. As they began to walk back, Jeff, Via's 15-year-old son, came rushing towards them shouting that another Bigfoot was on the scene. Jeff had watched it through an infrared scope as it walked behind the men. A few days later, on the 5th of November, Via and several other people chased a Bigfoot for some hours. It was surrounded by vehicles with their lights blazing, but still it managed to escape into the brush. A rancher who had joined the hunt was puzzled by its escape. He had heard a noise like someone out of breath and a pounding like the sound of running feet. I put my flashlight right where I could plainly hear it, only where it should have been. There was nothing in sight. Now what I'm wondering is, can this thing make itself invisible when things get too close for comfort? More tantalizing hints that some big feet may not be completely physical creatures. If we accept that police officers are usually reliable people experienced in accurately observing the unexpected and keeping a cool head, then we must accept that their Bigfoot sightings cannot easily be dismissed. Lieutenant Verdell Villa saw a Bigfoot more than once around Little Eagle, and a police lieutenant was on the scene at East Bruton, Alabama when a Bigfoot was spotted. The events of the 6th of March, 1978, began at night when Mrs. Ruth Mary Gibson, alone at her rural home, heard a shrill screaming. Scared, she rang her brother, Luke McDaniel, who came over. He too heard the screaming, but could see nothing except that the horses were running, the hogs were hollering, but the dogs had left. He told his sister to call the police, and soon Lieutenant Doug McCurdy arrived, as did 19-year-old Johnny Gibson. The screaming continued, then they noticed something moving into the road. Lieutenant McCurdy later reported that it was large and not human, nor any kind of animal he knew of. It crossed the road and went into the woods. Other police officers came and heard the screaming, but the Bigfoot kept out of sight. They soon left to attend to other business, and later McDaniel saw the creature again in his car lights. It stood around about six and one-half feet to seven feet tall, weighed about 400-some few pounds, and its eyes were solid red. I'd say the eyes were about 12 inches apart on its head. It had no neck at all, hairy all over. It kind of walked like a person. It was kind of in a hurry. Its arms seemed a little longer than a human being has. I'm not saying at all it was any Bigfoot. I've seen that on television, but I do know what I saw. I considered it might be an ape, but I got to thinking about it and it wasn't no ape. There's no ape that high. It wasn't a prank. There were too many guns out there, and a human couldn't move through thick brush like it did. The creature which prowled around 3925 North Tram Road in Vider, Texas, scared newly married Becky and Bobby Bussinger from their home. 
It regularly clawed at the window screens, howled and yelped, yet to a certain extent the couple could tolerate its presence. Then on Sunday, the 18th of June, 1978, they found two of their dogs dead, a third missing. On Monday night, Bobby decided to confront the intruder, a shaggy-haired, muscular creature over six feet tall. He took his 12-gauge shotgun outside and fired at the Bigfoot as it came towards him. Then he ran back inside and called the sheriff's office. Deputy Jack Reeves came and saw the broken screens for himself. He also caught a glimpse of the Bigfoot as it backed into the woods. While the deputy was there, Mr. and Mrs. Bussinger packed and left to stay with Becky's parents. The Big Feet were very active during the summer of 1978. Only a week after the events at Vider, 10-year-old Mike Lofton of South Cross at Arkansas had a hair-raising encounter with a seven-and-a-half-foot monster outside his home. He was alone there on the 26th of June, and the house is several miles away from the nearest neighbor. In the circumstances, Mike acted very bravely. He was feeding his puppy when it began to whine and tremble. He looked up and saw the Bigfoot only 50 feet away. It had its arms raised above its head and seemed to have claws for fingernails. Mike ran indoors and grabbed his father's loaded 22 rifle. He fired seven times at the thing, which turned and toddled like a baby back into the woods. Mike then called the police, who came and found blood and hair. A few days later, an unusual creature nicknamed Big Head turned up at Butler, Ohio. Sightings were made on the 8th, 10th, and 12th of July, 1978. The first by Eugene Klein, 17, and Ken O'Neill, 15, as they walked along the railway. They heard a strange noise in the brush, and turning in that direction, saw a creature seven feet tall and with a head larger than its body. Its red eyes were as big as golf balls, and its face was horrible. It growled, and Eugene felt compelled to communicate with it. He could not move for a while. Then he threw his light at the creature and ran. He was still in a nervous state when interviewed by Ron Schaffner and Earl D. Jones two months later. Two days after his sighting, Lavina Klein and others saw Big Head squatting down at a railway crossing. She too noticed its red eyes. On the 12th of July, Teresa Klein, Eugene's 15-year-old sister, heard a freight train horn as she was pitching hay. Turning towards the railway, she saw Big Head and ran home screaming. She saw its orange-red eyes and heard its cry, like a cat only deeper. She also smelled a strong odor, like cow manure. There were a number of Bigfoot sightings around Atossin, Iowa, between July and September 1978, some of them involving children. On the 31st of July, three boys aged between 10 and 12 saw a five-foot-tall, dark brown creature which was hunched over. It had a wide forehead, a flat nose, and deep-set eyes. Sometimes it ran on all fours, sometimes on two feet. The boys first saw the Bigfoot in an old shed. Hearing noises, they threw a rock inside, and they saw a dark, furry head. They ran away, looking back to see the creature running among some bins. Later they saw it again, and this time ran after it, saying that they thought it was more scared of us than we were of it. When they spotted it in a cornfield, it just stood and looked at them. Having watched its behavior, they said that it doesn't do anything until you do, but when it moves, it moves real fast. In Oceana, West Virginia, experts who had not seen the creature that policeman Bill Pruitt saw at 4 a.m. on the 14th of August were explaining it away as a bird, probably a crane or a heron, Prude was understandably annoyed. It looked like a man, he reported. I've never seen any bird that tall. His encounter had begun when he heard a noise like babies crying in an alley. It made the hair stand up on the back of your neck. It wasn't no panther. I've heard a panther. Then he saw the creature under a street lamp, looking just like a huge man. It stood six and a half to seven feet tall, and as he got out of his car, it ran down to the river and jumped its 30-foot width. Pruitt emptied his gun at it, and the Oceana police chief just arrived, fired seven rounds at it with his rifle. But it just kept going. They found no blood, only broken tree limbs and huge, round footprints. In our earlier book, Alien Animals, we wrote about several kinds of mystery creatures. Lake monsters, out-of-place big cats, ghostly black dogs, giant birds and birdmen, 
and Bigfoot Yeti Yowie. We remarked that, although these creatures have a number of similar characteristics, which might suggest that they are all part of a single phenomenon, there are very few incidences on record where one kind of alien animal has been seen side by side with another kind. The 21st of August 1978 sighting in Paris Township, Ohio, is one of those rare cases. It took place at the home of the Caton family near Minerva, and there were nine witnesses. They were out on the porch at 10.30 p.m. when they heard noises near a demolished chicken coop. They saw two pairs of yellow eyes reflecting the lights of their torches, so Scott Patterson, 18, drove towards the coop in his car to try and see the animals more clearly. He saw that the eyes seemed to belong to two puma-like animals. As he watched, a Bigfoot strode on two legs in front of the cats as if to protect them. It then lurched towards Patterson's car. At this, the witnesses back at the house rang the sheriff's office and sat in the kitchen to wait. The Bigfoot appeared at the kitchen window and was clearly seen by the yard light as it stood there for ten minutes. The group inside had guns, but decided not to fire unless the creature attacked. Mary Ackerman, 30, said, It doesn't seem to want to bother anyone. It was just curious. We feel it wants to be friends. The Bigfoot suddenly left and was no longer to be seen when Deputy Sheriff James Shannon arrived. He could still smell it, though, an ammonia sulfur smell. Mrs. Ackerman saw the creature again the next day, the 22nd of August, near the Caton's house, and how Caton, 18, saw something strange at the house on the 23rd of August. There were further possible sightings on the 8th and 9th of September, one by Mrs. Ackerman, who this time saw two big feet. The authority's official explanation of the 21st of August sighting of a Bigfoot and two pumas was a bear and two cubs. But Mrs. Caton was not convinced. She told investigators Ron Schaffner and Earl D. Jones that they were not bears unless they were mutated. Before the major sighting of the 21st of August, the Caton family had seen a six to seven foot dark haired creature around the abandoned strip mines at the beginning of the month. We return to Michigan for the last major sighting of 1978. Morris Easterling, 53, of Lansing, was cleaning his garage about 9.30 p.m. on the 2nd of December. As he was about to back his car, he noticed a figure through the rearview mirror. It was large, about 7 feet and 4 to 500 pounds, and walking on two legs. He took it to be a woman in a fur coat, possibly a neighbor. He could not make out the face, though the head appeared small. He called out, Can I help you? What do you want? The creature, 12 to 15 feet away, seemed to be walking with something of a limp down the driveway towards the orchard. Easterling drove forward and round a curve, but by the time he had got out of the car, the creature had gone. This did not seem possible, as Easterling commented, I just can't believe how quickly that thing disappeared. The earliest interesting case in 1979 is a sighting of Nobby, the North Carolina Bigfoot, on the 15th of January. This creature had been seen from time to time around Carpenter's Knob in Cleveland County during the last three months of 1978, but Gay Smith's close encounter gave her a particularly good view of the beast. She was traveling by car with her two sisters when on Highway 10 between Caesar and Polkville, Wanda Smith screamed, and it was some minutes before the other two could get her to tell what she had seen. When she did so, they turned the car around and went back. Near some woods by a farm pond, they all saw Nobby. 18-year-old Gay ran from the car towards the creature, which was on a dam. It squatted there, then stood up, faced her, and stretched out its arms. At a distance of about 150 feet on a bright sunny day, she could see it clearly, and later gave a good description. It was awful, just terrible. He was great big, maybe bigger than Dale, a friend who is six foot two and weighs about 200 pounds, and terribly strange looking. He was kind of pink faced. She also added that its facial hair was shorter than that on the rest of the body, and that it was very broad chested with wide shoulders. He just went down to nothing at the waist. His legs were large at the thighs, but very thin below the knees, almost as thin as a cow's legs. She also saw wide nostrils and a shiny black chest. It almost looked like tar. He was sort of black and brown mixed. He looked more like a gorilla than anything else I can think of. And there was something white beside him on the dam. 
I don't know if it was a bird he had killed or just an empty sack or paper bag. Whatever it was didn't move, and I couldn't tell if it was some kind of animal or not. Most people who see Bigfoot are, not unnaturally, afraid, and in a state of fear, the reaction is to shoot at it, regardless of whether it shows any sign of attacking. Big feet are remarkably brave, or foolhardy, in the face of such belligerence. However, as the cases in this book will have shown, there is no 100% reliable report of a Bigfoot having been killed, and although Big Feet have sometimes apparently been injured by gunfire, they have always been able to escape at speed. The evidence suggests that there is little point in shooting at a Bigfoot. It is difficult to kill, perhaps impossible, and anyway, the creature shows little desire to harm humans, even when the opportunity presents itself. The next two cases both involve shooting at an injury of Big Feet, and both demonstrate the futility of such action though probably the witnesses would argue that shooting at them at least scared the big feet away. We don't believe that injuring an apparently harmless, albeit somewhat fearsome-looking creature is justified, even in the circumstances described. The first case took place at Flower Lake near Tunica, Mississippi in March 1979. On Friday night, the 9th of March, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Goff noticed a foul smell and heard a ruckus. On the Saturday night, they saw a seven to eight foot creature near the house. On Saturday night, Goff and his son Rodney armed themselves and waited for the Bigfoot. When he saw it, Rodney fired with his 22 rifle. It seemed to be hit and ran away, but later that night it returned and pushed on the front door, breaking the frame. Next day, the family found blood spots around the door. They also found tracks 16 to 18 inches long. Nearly two months later, at the end of April, 16-year-old Tim Meisner claimed two sightings in three days in British Columbia. He was fishing with a friend on Dunn Lake near Barrier on the 28th of April when they heard a high screech and across the lake saw a Bigfoot with its arms raised. It ran off into the brush and the youths went over to investigate, finding a deer with a broken neck hidden under branches and moss. Meisner and four others returned to the site two days later and having separated to search, Meisner again saw a Bigfoot. He was about nine feet tall, black and hairy. He had a human-like face with great big glaring bright eyes and shoulders four feet wide, he reported. He stood there glaring at me for at least three seconds. He was 50 feet away, so close I could smell him. I don't even know why I shot. I was just scared, really scared. He continued, I was aiming for right between his eyes, and he went down on one knee and one hand. At first I thought he was dead, but I guess I only grazed him because he got up and ran away at about 30 miles an hour. Nearly 200 years have passed since the first reliable Bigfoot sighting reports were recorded, but Bigfoot is still being seen and is still a mystery in most of the U.S. states. In early 1980, a previously little visited state, Utah, became the center of attention. It was about 12.20 a.m. on the 4th of February when Ronald Smith of South Weber, arriving home from work, had a typical close encounter with the Bigfoot. I was going back to feed the horse, and he wouldn't come to the fence. I started out there to feed him, and I heard, crunch, crunch. It was something walking on two legs through the snow. Since only the horse is out there, I thought it might have been some kids getting into something. I looked out there. It was moonlit and I saw this dark figure walking across the pasture. I thought it was a high school kid trying to get away before I saw him. I didn't think of how big it was. I saw it walk into some trees. The horse wasn't scared, but it was acting a little funny and looking over that way. Then I heard the screams. They were unlike anything I've ever heard. They sounded like a cougar, but only with a lot of volume. They were just different. I got out of there and into the house. My wife was telling me to get a gun or a camera, but it only lasted seconds. It screamed four times when I was outside and three more times after I got inside. I told my wife, I think it's Bigfoot out there. And I was sort of kidding, but these screams were unbelievable. Next morning, Smith found traces of footprints in the snowy field, but the horse had trampled over them. Two journalists on the local newspaper also looked for tracks and found some in snow near a canal. They were over 15 inches long, about 4 feet apart, and had been made by something heavy. 
Alongside ran a smaller set of identical tracks. When news of this and an earlier sighting got out, other people began to tell of hearing strange noises, of smelling strange smells, and of other unusual experiences, possibly involving Bigfoot. Black hair found on a barbed wire fence was analyzed and said to have come from a cow. It was the end of the month before Bigfoot was actually seen again, at Riverdale, a few miles from South Weber. Lee Padilla was driving along a main highway at 3.30 a.m. on the 25th of February when, he says, a creature 10 to 11 feet tall loped across the road about 25 feet ahead of him. He saw it for only a few seconds, but that was long enough to register its graceful movement, its long arms and legs, gorilla-like head, and long, dark brown, furry hair in layers. Padilla estimated it weighed about 600 pounds and was running at 35 miles per hour. Apparently he was not frightened by what he saw, for he turned off the main road onto a side road and directed his headlights in the direction the creature had gone, but he did not see it again. Next day, Padilla and two newspapermen looked for footprints, but found none. In June 1980, the center of attention moved to Ohio, where there were several good sightings in Logan and Union counties. The strangest was the encounter reported by Union County Legal Secretary Mrs. Donna Reigler. She was driving home from work on the 24th of June. It was a stormy evening after a hot, muggy day. Lightning flickered, the sky darkened, and large drops of rain began to fall. But Mrs. Ragler had no inkling of what was about to happen. She told a reporter, I was in a good mood, I just wanted to get home. I went over the railroad tracks slow. I always do because I don't want to knock my wheels out of line. Then I saw this thing laying on the road, hunched over. I thought it was a big dog at first. Then it stood up, and I thought it was a man. I thought he was crazy laying out on the road. I couldn't figure out why he was out there. He had no golf clubs, no luggage. Then he turned around and looked at me. When asked for more details of the creature's appearance, she demonstrated its posture, upright with knees bent and hands held out, palms up. She could not see any facial features. Mrs. Regler escaped as fast as she could, stopping at a stranger's house where, Unnerved by her experience, she broke down and sobbed. There are several similarities in her story to that told by Patrick Poling, a Union County farmer who saw Bigfoot while working in his cornfield a week before Mrs. Ragler's encounter. The creature came out of the woods bordering the field and walked along the fence line. Mr. Poling said it was about seven feet tall and walked with its knees bent. Feeling safe on his tractor, Mr. Poling drove towards it to get a closer view and to see its face. Even though he got within 30 yards of it, he still could not make out any facial features. There was nothing there, he said. The Bigfoot stopped and turned towards him, holding its hands out, palms up. As a newspaper reporter commented, both Mrs. Ragler and Mr. Poling are believable witnesses, and both are heartily sick of the attention paid to them since they reported their sightings. Plagued by phone calls, pestered by the media, Mr. Poling said he refused to go on radio or television. One television station told me everybody wants to be on television. I told them I didn't. Does that sound like the attitude of a hoaxer? Usually they enjoy the publicity accompanying their escapade. Charles Fulton and his mother-in-law, Anna Mae Saunders, are also unlikely hoaxers. Their brush with Bigfoot came on the night of the 4th of October, 1980, at their rural home in a heavily wooded area of Maysville, North Kentucky. They were watching television with Mrs. Fulton and the four Fulton children when they heard a loud noise outside. Mr. Fulton opened the front door and saw a seven-foot-tall, white-haired Bigfoot standing on the porch holding a rooster. It jumped from the porch, chased by Fulton who fired at it, apparently without effect. Mrs. Saunders also saw it, but Mr. Fulton had the closest view of the creature and said it had glowing animal-like eyes. A week later, on the 10th of October, J. L. Toomey of Fleming County, also in North Kentucky, had a similar visitation. He too was watching television in the evening when he heard a noise on the back porch of his trailer home. He grabbed a pistol and ran out of the front door round to the back. He was just in time to see what looked like a big man running towards the woods. I emptied my pistol at it as it ran. 
He went indoors to get more bullets, and when he came out, he saw the figure again. He fired at it, but did not appear to hit it. It was very dark, Mr. Toomey told a reporter, so I really couldn't tell exactly what it was. It stood up like a man, and it was big, but it was so dark, about all I could see was a big shadow. It made a thumping noise as it ran. Although he saw no detail, he was obviously convinced that his nocturnal visitor was not human, else he would surely not have fired at it so vigorously. It was found that the Bigfoot had broken into the back porch and raided the freezer. Frozen meat was lying around the porch and in the backyard, and two loaves of bread, a frozen chicken, and a packet of hot dogs were missing. As Mr. Toomey commented, if it was a man, he must have been awfully hungry to break in while I was in the house. A regular animal, like a bear or a dog, couldn't have opened the freezer and carried those packages. Sheriff's deputies and sightseers arrived soon after the incident was reported by Mr. Toomey. Many of them armed, but although they scoured the woods that night, no intruder was found. Next day, some footprints were found in wet sand, apparently made by a bare foot, and about 14 inches long and 6 inches wide, and some long white hairs were found on the porch.